Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher and this is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the Presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Ulysses Grant, and the focus is Grant fights, Grant wins. The year is 1862 and President Abraham Lincoln is frustrated, even in the wake of the victory of Ant at Antietam, very bloody battle, the American forces win it, but Lincoln is tired of George McClellan as his commanding general, he doesn't think he's going to be effective, he is out, and Grant's boss in the West, Henry Halleck, is put in his place, moving to Washington, D.C. to be that commanding general. That left the Western Theater in the hands of Grant and Don Buell. Lincoln made another move at the same time. He announced his draft Emancipation Proclamation. As of January 1st, any state that was still in rebellion, all of their black slaves would be freed per the order of the commander-in-chief out of a military necessity. Grant, of course, from an abolitionist family, had no problems with that. In fact, he embraced it wholeheartedly. A lot of blacks started coming into his camp, escaping uh, in advance of the order from the South. Grant welcomed them. In fact, he also welcomed black soldiers. Part of the Emancipation Proclamation was to enable their commanders in the Union Army to bring blacks actually into the armed forces, and Grant was all for all of this. But Grant had another group of folks that he was not happy with, and he made an order that he would later regret. In fact, it was the only time that Lincoln ever repudiated something that Grant did. It wasn't on the battlefield. This was more behind the scenes. What was happening? Well, Southerners were shipping contraband, principally cotton, through illegal means to buyers in the North. And Grant thought this was undermining the operation of the military, and he wanted to shut it down. And he blamed one group for facilitating this sale, and that was the Jews. And he effectively issued an order to kick them out of the area. General Orders Number 11 said the Jews as a class violating every regulation of trade established by the Treasury Department and also department orders are hereby expelled from the department. Within 24 hours from the receipt of this order by post commanders, they will see that all of this class of people are furnished with passes and required to leave. And anyone remaining after such notification will be arrested and held in confinement until an opportunity occurs of sending them out as prisoners unless furnished with permits from these headquarters. Well, as soon as President Lincoln heard about this, he did repudiate these orders. This was not something he was gonna to tolerate. He told his Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, go get Grant to rescind these orders immediately, and to his credit, Grant did. In fact, Grant realized this was a mistake. He rescinded the orders without question. He would later be challenged on this as discriminatory, especially in his political career, and Grant made no excuses. It was a mistake. He repudiated them. He never tried to defend the orders, and he got rid of it almost as soon as he issued them. He wanted to focus, of course, on the military situation, and for him, the grand prize left in the West was Vicksburg, Mississippi. This was the last sort of obstacle that the South commanded that was really cutting off the Mississippi from uh, the Union Army. The Union Army could go up and down the river as long as they captured Vicksburg. But this was going to be a tough fight. Others had tried. This was an incredibly well-defended de uh, city. Vicksburg sitting right on a hill just above the Mississippi River. So if you're going to try to attack from the river, they had guns ablazing ready to go right after you. Initially, Grant tried to maybe attack from the north of Vicksburg, and he sent General William Sherman and a, and a bunch of men to try to do that immediate re repulsed. This was not going to be an option. Grant's trying to figure out what to do. He could try to go around the town, but the problem was on the western side of the river, this was all swampland. There was no way to get supplies through. He could potentially get his men through marching through those swamps, but he couldn't get the artillery. He couldn't get his food, his medicine, other provisions. That was impassable on the, the marshy side of the river. So what was he going to do? He originally came up with a plan to maybe redirect the river, the mighty Mississippi, build a canal that would go around the site of the guns of the Confederates and see if he could get his men and supplies around that way. And he put 6,000 men on this, including 2,000 blacks, and they tried for several months. They could not get anywhere. The Mississippi was too strong. It just wasn't going to work. So now we're into April of 1863, and Grant's figuring out he has no choice. The only thing he has left is to literally try to run that gauntlet, send the supply ships through the Mississippi, right past those Confederate guns, and frankly hope they could get through. He would send his men around through the swamps, and then they would pair up south of the city, try to cross the river there, and see if they could then attack from the 
other side of Vicksburg. Well, several of General's commanders, including uh, several of Grant's commanders, including General William Sherman, were against this idea, but Grant was never one for sort of councils of war. He didn't like to get his generals around and ask their advice. He just took his own counsel most of the time, and he made his decision that this was the only way to go. He had to get Vicksburg, and this was the only way to do it. So he had Admiral David Porter, who was leading the naval forces within his group, and he had 10 ships to try to run past these, these Confederate guns. They were, he had some gunboats, he had transports packed with supplies, and on the night of April 16th, which was a, moonlight, a moonless night, so the little light as possible, he spaced his ships out about 50 yards apart, and off they went. And Grant was there along with Julia, and his son Fred were there alongside. They were visiting at this time, and they were watching. And at first, it seemed like they went undetected. But then all of a sudden, the skies opened up, and 500 rounds of artillery came pouring down on these ships. 70 of them were hits, but fortunately for the Union, only one ship went down, the rest made it through. Grant said at the time the sight was magnificent but terrible, typical understated uh, comments from General Grant, but the problem was it wasn't enough. They did the math afterwards and they realized they frankly still didn't have enough provisions and supplies and food to make this next round of the campaign successful. So again, what was Grant going to do? He couldn't use Admiral uh, Porter's ships anymore. They were too beat up. He eventually got six steamers and 12 barges pulled together, and he's going to take another shot at it. This is April 22nd, just, just a few days later, to try to get some more through to be able to make this effect, an effective campaign. And sure enough, he tried. A lot of those barges sunk in the, in the process. Several of the other ships were shot up, but he eventually got enough through that he was confident that he could make that journey across. And sure enough, met up with his uh, foot soldiers who had made it, a, made it down below. They got to a, near the town of Bruinsburg, crossed over the river, and after all these months, Grant was finally in a position to take on the campaign he wanted to do. He said, I was on dry ground on the same side of the river with the enemy. All the campaigns, labors, hardships, and exposures from the month of December previous to this time that had been made and endured were for the accomplishment of this one object. Most th thought, didn't think he could pull this off, including President Abraham Lincoln, who questioned a lot of the strategy, but he did let Grant go forward. And sure enough, Grant was right where he wanted to be. Lincoln had kind of put his eyes on Grant, trying to keep an eye on him to see exactly what was this guy made of. And he, he put Charles Dana, an assistant secretary of the War Department, into Grant's command to try to get some insight into the character of this person. And Grant, to his credit, actually welcomed Dana into his inner circle. He also had another person on hand, uh, Congressman Elihu Washburn, who was sort of Grant's benefactor in, in Congress, was also on this trip. And he sent Lincoln back maybe a reassuring note, trying to give Lincoln a sense of this man, Ulysses Grant. And this is what he said, on this whole move of five days, he, Grant, had neither a horse nor an orderly or servant, a blanket or overcoat or clean shirt or even a sword. His entire baggage consists of a toothbrush. This is the plain and ordinary but highly effective Ulysses Grant. Well, again, Grant had some choices to make. He could take all of his men and go straight for Vicksburg. That's where General John Pemberton had about 30,000 men still well entrenched with earthworks all surrounding even on this side of the river. But he had another challenge. He knew that Joseph Johnston had about 6,000 Confederates in the nearby capital of Jackson, Mississippi. It's a little over 40 miles between uh, Vicksburg on the river and Jackson a little bit inland. And Grant was worried about Johnston. So he decided instead of going directly at Pemberton and Vicksburg, he would try to eliminate Johnston first get him out of the way, and then go after Pemberton. Grant himself has about 35,000 men on this journey, and so he went straight into Jackson. Johnston realized, well, he can't put up a fight against this many men. He quickly got out of there, headed sort of to the north and east of the town. Jack, uh, Grant and his men rode into Jackson. They took over the capital. They actually burned down anything related to munitions or production of arm, uh, armaments that was happening in Jackson, and he was ready now to turn on Pemberton. Well, Pemberton had heard about what was going on, and he took his men out of Vicksburg, and now they're converging about halfway through in a place called Champions Hill. This was, again, a battle 
hand-to-hand -hand combat, back and forth, attack and counterattack, very unsure for a while who was going to actually take the control of the hill, but eventually the Union soldiers triumphed. Pemberton had to turn, run back into Vicksburg, and once again get behind his works. This gave Grant a moment to pause because he had to go see somebody who had been shot, injured in this battle near Champions Hill. It was his 12-year-old son, Fred, who had been along for the ride, got a little bit too close to the action, was shot in the leg. Fortunately, he would be okay, but a little distraction for General Grant. Well, Grant arrives at Vicksburg. Of course, Grant's aggressive. He wants to go attack, and so he does. He sends his men in against the uh, de stout defensive works of the, of the Confederates, immediately repulsed, significant losses. Tried again the next day, repulsed, significant losses. So. Grant decides to settle in for a siege. He feels that's going to be the most effective route. He's got his Navy monitoring the Mississippi, so there's no escape for the Confederates that way. And now he's up to 75,000 men as, as, as reinforcements had been pouring in. He puts an airtight 12-mile siege line around Vicksburg and begins bombardments the very next day. Incessant bombardments, nonstop. The population in Vicksburg, the civilian population, basically had to build these mud tunnels, these mud hut areas that they could go into almost like caves to be able to protect themselves from the bombardments. Food is being dwindled. They're all at half rations, quarter rations, eventually no rations. It's early July, July 3rd, no help coming, and Pemberton agrees that he's got to surrender. Pemberton asked for terms. Now remember, this is the unconditional surrender grant from the days at Fort Donelson. He wasn't interested in terms. He just wanted an unconditional surrender, and Pemberton was balking at that. And so Pemberton finally says, you know, again, Grant, let's at least meet. Grant agrees to have a meeting. They talk it through, and Pemberton has one main thing that he wants. He doesn't want his men sent to prison camps in the north. He wanted his men to be paroled, which meant on their honor, they would go home and agree not to rejoin the fight. Now, Grant didn't have to accept this. Grant's entirely in command here. He could have let the people in there starve or eventually take them over through arms. But Grant does give in to this request. He says the men will be paroled the very next day, July 4th of 1863. Vicksburg is now in the hands of the Union Army. This is the day that changed the uh, focal point of the war because General George Meade was winning at Gettysburg at exactly the same time. Abraham Lincoln, of course, is thrilled with what's happening in Vicksburg. He wasn't quite as happy at, at Gettysburg because Meade didn't chase Robert E. Lee back after that battle. He had no qualms, in fact, just endless praise for what Grant was able to do in now securing the entire Mississippi for the Union Army. Lincoln wrote, I do not remember that you and I ever met personally. I write this now as a grateful acknowledgement for the almost inestimable service you have done the country. I wish to say a word further, because then he goes on in this letter and talks about his doubts about the campaign, but he ultimately concludes, honestly, I now wish to make the personal acknowledgement that you were right and I was wrong. You don't always get a letter like that from the President of the United States. Charles Dana, who was now in, embedded with Grant at the time, also wrote kind of a word picture about Grant that was, that was pretty apt. Grant was an uncommon fellow, the most modest, the most disinterested, and the most honest man I ever knew, with a temper that nothing could disturb, and a judgment that was judicial in its comprehensiveness and wisdom. Not a great man, except morally. Not an original or brilliant man, but sincere, thoughtful, deep, and gifted with courage that never faltered. When the time came to risk all, he went in like a simple-hearted, unaffected, unpretending hero whom no ill omens could deject and no triumph unduly exalt. It's a pretty good description of Ulysses Grant. Well, President Lincoln decided to make some more changes. He actually summoned Grant to a private meeting, kind of a mystery meeting. We didn't even know who he was going to talk to when he hooked up in Indianapolis with the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, who came out personally to tell Grant that he was now in charge of what was called the New Military Division of the Mississippi. Basically, the entire Western theater was put into Grant's command. Grant had some immediate decisions to make because part of his troops in that theater were in trouble. General William Rosecrans had, just, Rosecrans had just suffered the loss at Chickamauga, just outside of Chattanooga. His units had gotten back into Chattanooga, but now they were surrounded by the Confederates. They were under siege. The Confederates had the high ground on Lookout Mountain, Missionary Ridge, which surrounded the town, and they, they were unable to escape from the back of the city either because of the Confederate guns were honed in on them as well. So they were in trouble. 
What did Grant do? He went straight to the front. He ordered others, reinforcements to come. He wanted General Sherman in place. General George, General Joseph Hooker was actually reassigned from the Army of the Potomac to come in and focus on getting Rosecrans's folks out, but Rosecrans would not be involved. Grant relieved him and, and put uh, General George Thomas in charge. So everybody's focusing now on Chattanooga. Grant gets there and the men are demoralized. They haven't, they're not getting food, there's no supplies coming in. Small groups of people could come in, but nothing big enough to resupply these men. But there was a, an, an engineer by the name of William Baldy Smith. He had a plan. He found a spot that he believed he could ford the river and get across supplies, reinforce and help end the siege part of this because he found a spot that it was uncovered by the Confederate guns. If they could take this spot, build a pontoon bridge, all of a sudden the siege would be over. Grant loved the idea. Five days after his arrival, in fact, the siege was over. Morale shot up and Grant had another choice to make. He could leave the field of battle because, again, he is under gun, Missionary Ridge to the east, Lookout Mountain to the south, all on top of Chattanooga, full view, and Grant had no way to dislodge these folks apparent, you know, from the apparent eye. Was he going to just take them on? He could leave, maybe find some better ground, fight another day. He could do what a lot of the uh, Union commanders would often do is he'd wait. He'd wait for more reinforcements before he would try to take on this really tough fight, or he would just go into the fight and try to take those hills. Knowing Grant, that's what he decided to do. And he didn't wait months to do it. In less than a month, he, all he was doing was waiting for Sherman to finally arrive with all of his men, and then he was ready to go. It was a three-part attack. General Hooker would take his men to Lookout Mountain. Again, this was to the south. It would be Sherman going to the north of Mission Missionary Ridge to try to attack from there. And General Thomas, with Grant along his side, would go straight to the east and take on Missionary Ridge directly in front of them. About two miles away was the, was the amount of uh, ground they had to cover. So on day one of the battle, Hooker, phenomenal success. Slowly but surely climbs up that lookout mountain takes over the Confederates, they start running to the top, and in fact, some are retreating away, a tremendous victory for Hooker to try to gain that southern edge. Sherman was really stopped. A very narrow gap is all he had on the north side of Missionary Ridge, and he couldn't get through. The defenses were too stout. He's trying, he's sending everything he's got, but he can't get through. In the center part, it's Thomas, and he and his men made about a half halfway to a place called Orchard Knob, about a mile in from the city, but still a mile away from Missionary Ridge, Grant alongside him. Day one, not a great for Sherman, the rest very effective. Day two of the fight and it would be over. Hooker continued his climb into Lookout Mountain. Confederates all came across that and they're hustling back to try to get to friendly uh, defenses behind on Missionary Ridge with Hooker in return. Sherman is still stuck, still north of Missionary Ridge, unable to get through. But Thomas's men were sent directly into the fire at the base of Missionary Ridge, where they took out the rifle pits at the bottom. But then they had, they had a decision to make, and they didn't have really any orders to do next. And so Thomas and Grant are kind of spying this through their binoculars, what's going on at Missionary Ridge, and all of a sudden, their men started to rise because they're being shot at from directly above. They're exposed at the base of the hill. So what do they do? They just went up and climbed the hill without orders, and sure enough, they overtook the Confederate line and pushed them all the way back into Georgia, which was right behind them. This is an amazing accomplishment, and Charles Dana was there to see it, and he said the storming of the ridge by our troops was one of the greatest miracles in military history. No man who climbs the ascent by any of the roads that wind along its front can believe that 18,000 men were moved up its broken and crumbling face unless it was his fortune to witness the deed. They were certainly inspired and they were successful. And all of a sudden, the Confederates were basically out of Tennessee. This had completely opened things up for the Union soldiers to now basically open up a campaign into Georgia in the South, and General Grant had done it again. For Abraham Lincoln, he wrote, I wish to tender you and all under your command my more than thanks, my profoundest gratitude for the skill, courage, and perseverance with which you and they over so great difficulties have affected that important object. God bless you all from Vicksburg to Chattanooga, 
one success after another for Ulysses Grant. And as far as Abraham Lincoln was concerned, he was about to go all in with Grant, but that is the story for another day. That is Ulysses Grant. Grant fights, Grant wins from the life of Ulysses Grant. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.